Welcome to the Psychedelia Podcast, where we talk about the third wave of psychedelics. Through our many wide-ranging conversations with scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and event organizers, we bring you an exclusive look into the many minds of the psychedelic world. It's time to let the word out about psychedelics and how they can be used as tools to benefit both the individual and the community. Welcome to the third wave. Hey, listeners. Welcome back to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin. For anyone who is a new listener, and we might have quite a few this week, I want to just welcome you to the podcast. This podcast is about the changing cultural conversation around psychedelics and how we can look at the responsible reintegration of them into a global society. Today's podcast is with the New York Times bestselling author, Mark Manson, who recently published the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. I interviewed Mark when I was in New York a couple weeks ago at a pretty loud breather room. Breather is a cool new app that you can use to book office spaces in various cities around the world for a one hour, two hours, or you know, a half day. And I booked a breather room, and unfortunately, right outside the breather room was a bunch of construction. So we did our best with the podcast audio and noise. I will apologize to our regular listeners and any new listeners in terms of the quality we did our best to improve it, but it might be lacking in certain areas. We did this podcast in person, and I had a wonderful time getting to know Mark. I had known of Mark for a few years, had been reading his blog for a considerable period of time, and read his recent book as well. We also share a number of mutual friends, and so when I read one of his pieces on his blog a few years ago about a bad acid trip, I knew that in starting this podcast, I really wanted to get him on to hear more about his thoughts on his own LSD experiences, as well as his general thoughts about how the intersection of psychedelics and personal development, where that intersection is and how it develops. So we had a great conversation about various things. A few more notes. Uh, Like every other podcast, we have a This Week in Psychedelics. So this is just a couple updates from the psychedelic world. First of all, we had a feature in Playboy. So Playboy just wrote a piece about microdosing. The article was entitled Creative Juice, How LSD Became the Go-To Drug of the Smartest Guy in the Room. And I am featured in that piece. I'll just read you a couple quick excerpts so that you can get a sense for it. And if you want to read the full piece, you can go ahead and click on that from our blog. Paul Austin, a successful entrepreneur turned microdosing advocate, surmises the utility of microdosing. He says it's not just in, is that it's not just an achieving the flow state, but that it helps entrepreneurs unlearn something. In Silicon Valley, where the mantra is fail hard, fail fast, and fail often, it's important to be able to re-examine your product or market by absorbing new knowledge while purging the old from your thought process. With microdosing, the critical unlearning process becomes honed. Ideas come together and memory recall. A coveted aspect of biohacking becomes significantly easier. Bad data out, good data in. Operating system upgraded. One more note. Austin adds that microdosing helps with impulse control because users become more mindful and present. By not being fixated in the past, anger is released. By not focusing on the future, anxiety is gone. By being in the present, there is greater joy in each moment, which domino effects into productivity. There is a sense of incongruence between our values and what's going on in the world. Microdosing allows you to re-examine that and make that a reality in our subjective experience. That's a direct quote from me. So if you want to see the full article, you can see that on our site. The second piece of news for this week in psychedelics is that a new study shows that people with more psychedelic experience have a more pro-environmental viewpoint. Nearly 1,500 people were surveyed and asked about their experience with classic psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, and mescaline, as well as their views on the environment and their ecological behaviors in terms of like saving water and recycling. The study suggests that lifetime experience with psychedelics in particular may contribute to people's pro-environmental behavior, regardless of core personality traits or general propensity to consume mind-altering substances. And you can see that full study. Again, we have a link on our website if you would like to view that. So now let's get into just a couple more things. Like I said, the interview this week is with Mark Manson, the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, Counterintuitive Approach to Living the Good Life. We talked for about an hour and a half, and we ended up keeping about an hour of that interview in total. So I think you guys will really enjoy it. A couple house cleaning things. In the last episode that we published, I emphasized the importance of listener-supported media. 
how it creates a truly independent voice. And although millennials, specifically people in my generation, have an apprehension to paying for digital media, really that's the only way forward to decorporatizing media and actually having a media sources that are honest, authentic, and stick to the truth and don't just curate their message based on corporate interests. So again, this podcast is listener supported. There will never be advertisements. At the same time, to make it sustainable, I do need financial support, bottom line. So we've introduced a couple other things to make it easier for you if you would like to donate. One, of course, there's always the Patreon page, patreon.com backslash the third wave, where if you donate, you will receive a number of gifts or prizes as a result of that. So there's a little bit of a give and take there. However, if that's too complicated for you, we also have a text to donate. Basically, that means you can text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 616-918-3200. GIVE, G-I-V-E, 616-918-3200. If you want to give and support the podcast, uh, you may do it by texting give to that number 616-918-3200 you'll be prompted for how much you can give it could be one dollar it could be as much as a hundred dollars or anything else a uh, payment is taken through credit cards and your donations will again support the podcast so that i can remain an independent voice and a credible media source in terms of what's going on in the psychedelic space and how that ties into addressing some of the major issues that we're dealing with as a global culture and society. Last thing, leave us a review on iTunes if you like the podcast. We had something like, I think, 2,500 downloads for some of these previous podcasts. If you're listening to this and you like it, please leave us a review on iTunes. It will help more people find the podcast, and it would mean a lot to all of us at The Third Way. Again, thanks for tuning in, and enjoy our podcast this week with Mark Manson. Let's transition into your story a little bit. Okay. I just want to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. You know, right before when I was having coffee, I, I read through the piece that you did about your badass trip. Oh, cool. And I read that a few years ago, which is yeah. when I was like, okay, so he's obviously doing LSD because I had done <laughs> LSD when I was like 19. And, yeah. You know, it wasn't quite as challenging as, as, <laughs> as the description that you provide. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Like when you first started doing psychedelics? Sure. Like that. So I was a pretty rebellious kid slash teenager. Started smoking pot when I was 13. And I think I did acid the first time when I was 15? 15 or 16. And then I would say I did, I experimented with it. I probably did it, did like acid or shrooms maybe eight or 10 times in my teen years up until about the time I was 20. And then I think the, the bad acid trip happened when I was 19, which kind of got me to quit <laughs> doing drugs for a while. <laughs> I think I did it one more time in my 20s because I had a girlfriend who really wanted to do it. And then I did an MDMA throughout a lot of my 20s, mostly at parties and stuff. And then kind of stopped that in my late 20s. So I hadn't really done anything for a while, but it was a big part of my adolescence, particularly. It informed a lot of my experiences, my teen years. Of course, it just got me thinking. <laughs> in a bunch of different ways, most of which were completely inane and just like silly, but some profound ways too, as, as is usually the case. <laughs> well, I mean, what were some of those, you know, like for me, when I first did LSD, it helped me kind of come to terms with the fact that I was an outsider yeah. to some degree because I grew up in West Michigan. So it's the Bible Belt, more or less, in the Midwest. Yeah, exactly. So uh, everyone goes to church. You know, I grew yeah. up in a very conservative home. Not politically or socially necessarily, but just in terms of like Christian values, yeah. right? So drugs were bad. So like that helped me to kind of like recognize that maybe like have a little bit of courage in my own yeah. kind of thought process. And also like just for me, it was really informative. Like growing up, I was a little socially awkward. Mm-hmm. And so like it helped me to have that kind of objective lens of, oh, I am socially awkward and I'm socially awkward because when I have this interaction with someone, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, let's shift that a little bit. Yeah. Did you have any kind of insights or or things from those experiences that you I did I always tell people that there's kind of like there's always a ratio of kind of like stupid insights like pointless insights like important and profound insights and the funny thing is is like when you're actually on the drugs you don't know which one is which so I remember like it's actually the second time I took I ever took LSD I became obsessed with symmetry like 
I just for like five hours, like everything, like and like I'd look at the these pencils here, and like the table, and I'd be like, it's like symmetrical this way, and it's this way, you know, and like. I would clear everything off and like look at it from different angles. And to me, it was just this, like such an important thing, symmetry. <laughs> and then when I got sober, I was like, what the fuck was I thinking about? <laughs> but then there were other times too. There was one, one time in particular when I was 17, I kind of had, I guess what, you, what most people would call like a spiritual experience. But basically like I had this kind of like trans-egoic, like I transcended my own ego. So it was like I'm one with everything type of thing. And that was hugely powerful for me, just mainly because it, it set me upon a path. I came out of that trip basically like, what the fuck was that? What just happened to me? And it started me down a path of like reading a lot of philosophy and Eastern religion, Eastern spirituality, which eventually led me to where I am today. So it, it kind of like kickstarted that curiosity into that whole world. So that was like very, very influential on me. In terms of like my personal life, I think it, it definitely made me more accepting. I remember one time doing shrooms and having this like really profound realization that basically everybody's form of self-expression, like you could, if art is simply self-expression, then technically everybody is like being an artist all the time. So even that awkward, weird kid who, you, who like is hard to talk to is like, there's something beautiful in that. I remember really feeling that on a deep level. And it actually carried with me for a while, even after I came down. And like, that was pretty powerful. I think it, especially being in a high, like being in high school where people are just really fucking mean to each other. Like it was, especially in the States, I thought like I've yes. talked to friends in Europe and they're like, we didn't really have popular kids. We didn't really yeah. have like the sport thing. It's just like, we went to school and you studied and like people did their own thing. Yeah. And it's like, you know. yeah, it's the U S adolescent culture is really weird. I've, uh, my wife's Brazilian and like, I've told her, I was like, oh, you know, like a bully in high school. And she's like, what's a bully? And I explained it to her and she's like, that's horrible. Why would somebody do that? Nobody does that in Brazil. And she's like, no, we'll just like play soccer and like, <laughs> dance. <laughs> Got a card of it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was really, because high school, yeah, it feels like such a hostile environment where like who you're in with and who you're out with and like who's cool and who's a nerd is like seems so important at that time. I think that was my junior year. I just kind of like adopted this perception. Of, yeah, everybody's just who they are. And it's like, there's actually something, not only is that okay, but there's actually something kind of beautiful. And so I, I think it made me a lot more accepting. And then the other thing I'll say is actually goes back to the badass trip. So anybody who wants to read that, it's on, it's on my website. You just search badass trip on my website. It's in the archives, I think. If, you know, I, I kind of went up there. Yeah. So basically what happened, I tripped acid with a couple friends. We went to the park, but then we lost track of time, as happens. It got dark, and also it was the middle of the night, and we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. And so we went to a grocery store, I guess, just to like wander around, or like just be inside, I guess. And we were like covered in shit because we'd basically been like laying in the dirt <laughs> like all night. Like we were like tripping, like laying on the ground, like playing with leaves and stuff. And so we were just like filthy, like just completely dirty. And uh, the manager came out. We were like wandering around this grocery store for like twenty minutes. And the manager came out and kicked us out. And as we were leaving, like I heard him say to like the cashier or something, he said like, I don't know, he made like some quip about the homeless get like younger every day. Something like fucked up. But basically like he, he assumed we were homeless. Right. And that like freaked me out because I was like, wait a second. We're actually like, we go to a really nice private school. Like my family's wealthy. I'm going to college next year. Like me and my two friends were like really, really smart guys. And it just started freaking me out. It started it like, I was like, oh my God, this guy thinks I'm homeless. And it got me like questioning like my whole life decisions. And at that time, like, I think I was doing drugs too often. I was a slacker at school. I was getting high every day. I was doing drugs most weekends. And yeah, I just kind of had this like, holy shit, what am I doing with my life? I'm like fucking everything up. I'm squandering my time. Like I'm a really smart fortunate, privileged guy who has a lot of potential to do like good shit in the world. What what am I doing in a drainage ditch and like rolling around <laughs> with, like leaves and stuff? And so yeah, I, I just like I became like, everything. Anybody who's had a bad trip, like it's everything gets very dark very quickly. <laughs> like everything feels very bad. Like no matter what anybody says to you, it like, doesn't it like it just feels like awful. And uh, and I felt that way for the rest of the night. And I started sobering up. Like I told my friend, 
It's like, I'm not doing this anymore. He kind of laughed. He's like, yeah. And yeah, I basically stopped for the most part. I stopped doing it regularly at that point. And then, you know, kind of what you're saying is it made you face something or understand something about yourself, yeah. whatever that behavior and habit was. And then you, it kind of put you right in front of it. And you just had to look at it. Yeah. And I think that's interesting about what, like, psychedelics like LSD can do is, like, they illuminate things yeah. that we maybe try to keep hidden and we, you know, try to keep away. Well, and what's interesting about psychedelics is you can't... So, like, if I'm sober, like, right now, if I think about something, like, really unpleasant about myself, it's very easy for me to, like, distract myself and, and talk about something else or, like, look at my phone or whatever. For some reason, psychedelics, when your mind gets fixated on something, whether it's symmetry or I'm, like, wasting my potential, wasting my life, it doesn't let go. Like, it forces you to, like, it's like, all right, this is the theme. Like, my friends and I, we used to call it the theme of the night because we would just get obsessive about these, like, really strange things. And sometimes they would actually be really important things. And sometimes they won't. But, and, well, and sometimes but, they're, but, they're completely stupid. Yeah, like, and just, oranges. I've, I've had a thing for oranges so, in some friends. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned that night that one of my friends that night, he got obsessed with egg. He stole an eggplant from the grocery store. And he was obsessed with the thing the entire night. So this like fixation happened. And sometimes it can be completely frivolous and sometimes it can be really profound. I remember one of those friends, there was one time we started tripping and he like started freaking out about his like his family. He's just like, wow, my, my dad's a deadbeat. Like, and I'm becoming like him. Like he just started losing it. And I was like, whoa, dude, calm down. Look at the sun. Look, look at the stars. It's beautiful, yeah, really. Yeah, everything's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, everything's going to be fine, man. You know, it, and it's uh, it's interesting. And, and the interesting thing, too, is that you can't control it. You don't, you can't decide beforehand, like, all right, this trip, we're going to have fun with oranges tonight. You know, like, you don't get to decide. It just happens. It's just like something happens. Some experience or somebody says something funny happens, and it's like, that's it. You're, you're hooked. Well, this is, I think this is why, you know, the psychedelics in the 60s got such a bad rep because people were having these experiences yeah. and there was no channel on which they could kind of cultivate that energy. So they would have these experiences and they'd be wild and crazy and sometimes really profound and insightful and spiritual. But once they were done tripping, yeah. it's like, well, well, what then? So I, what's interesting now, I mean, what's your familiarity with like where psychedelics stand now? Have you seen any like articles or are you um, kind of somewhat familiar with? I would characterize myself as vaguely familiar. Okay. So, I mean, the thing that I'm curious about these days is is more like the therapeutic. I know there's a lot of research going on now, which I find that very interesting in terms of just kind of like more recreational stuff. I, but the, so the therapeutic stuff is the interesting stuff, yeah, yeah. right? Because it is like, okay, you can have this experience. Yeah. And then... It's not, it is about the experience, but it's more about the outcome. Yes. And in terms of how do you integrate that experience? How do you work with a psychotherapist to dig into this yes. experience? And this is why it's becoming so effective for like PTSD. You yeah. know, they're doing MDMA for PTSD yeah. trials or training phase three, psilocybin for depression. Yeah. And I was reading through the notes from your book. And for me, it was like, you know, you mentioned in some of your this subtle art, I'm not giving a fuck, how one of the things that prevents personal development is this refusal to accept death yeah. in a way. It's a refusal to face it. It's a refusal yeah. to understand that it's coming. And I think that, from a psychedelic perspective, is what's really interesting for me because now they've been doing like research at Johns Hopkins where they've given high doses of mushroom and psilocybin to people who, are, who have terminal cancer. And they have high levels of anxiety and they have high levels of depression and they give them one dose and anxiety and depression plummets. And these people can finally like enjoy last years of their life. Right. I think it's because, like you were saying, having this kind of quasi-spiritual, this mystical experience, sure. this kind of ego transcendence, it gives yeah. us a chance to like really kind of look at, okay, death happens at the same time. It does, you know, we don't need to be afraid of it because right. it's just a transition. Right. Yeah. No, it's when that stuff started coming out, like it didn't surprise me because I figure like, you know, I was saying earlier, like, you can't control it. And I guess that's not totally true. I guess it's like when you're in a recreational context, when you're at a party with, like, a group of friends and a bunch of, like, silly shit is happening. In that context, you can't control it. But I imagine, like, like one thing that excites me is I feel like if you get some guys with, like, real lab coats and, like, letters after their name working on this for a long enough period of time, that, yeah, maybe you can find some context where you can control it or you can direct it a little bit. Or, you know, use the stuff. Like, I, I keep hearing one of things I keep hearing about is like microdoses or people taking like smaller doses and, and that 
way they, they still have some like executive function in their brain to kind of like control where they're going. So like I find all that stuff fascinating and I'm, I don't have any, I haven't seen, like I'm not familiar with the research, but I would not be surprised to see if, like if there was a lot of utility. And I wouldn't be surprised if say like 10, 20 years from now, it's like, it's a common, like has common therapeutic applications. So I, I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah, so am I. I mean, I, I guess that's, I like psychedelics. I like doing psychedelics. I like microdosing. And obviously, yeah. this is why I'm, I'm building this platform and talking about these topics and doing yeah. this podcast. And I think they're interesting for various purposes, right? They're interesting for therapeutic purposes, I think, yeah. especially now because there are people who are basically suffering, who are suffering. And we know we have a substance that is, it's non-toxic, you know, sure. it's, it's non-addictive. It's been used historically for thousands of years. Yeah. And that we know if we create like a container for them that they, they will, there's a high likelihood that they could have X, Y, and Z out. Sure. So PTSD, you know, typically if you go to a typical doctor, you tell them that you have PTSD, they'll just give you antidepressants and tell yeah. you, sorry, you're never going to cure it. And I was doing an event in Portland like last month and a guy got up on stage to tell his story. He was a vet from Iraq, struggled with PTSD, went to the doctor. The doctor said, we'll never cure it. He enrolled in a phase two trials, took MDMA, was cured of PTSD. So it's like when it can be that, like that much of that a transformation. Powerful, yeah. That also for me is like, it's really important that we medicalize it. So yeah. that we use within a responsible integrated framework. At the same time, kind of building off that, I'm also interested in not only helping people who like struggle with X, Y, and Z. So they have yeah. some sort of, we could say like deficit, right? Sure. To get them up to a point where they're functioning normally. Yeah. But also like, you know, my curiosity is like the betterment of well people. So people who are already pretty good, they already have pretty good lives. What could creating a container for them with psychedelics do to help them live a better life? So like this concept of the mystical experience is really interesting because it helps people really come to terms with, I think, who they are. Yeah. And I think, you know, like we were talking about earlier in our conversation, there's with work, you know, when we don't have to be busy anymore, there's yeah. going to be a sense of what's our contribution, right? And if we have substances that can, you know, illuminate to some degree, maybe that helps people to really, really kind of get back in touch with a sense of who they are. And that's not to say that psychedelics are the only thing. Of course. There's meditation. Yeah. There's other things that kind of initiate this sense of being in the zone or these yeah. states of flow. But it seems like psychedelics are the most like instantaneous. Things. I agree with that. On the flip side, there are some dangers with them. And I don't mean physiological dangers. And I think, you know, you mentioned, like, why they get a bad rap, especially from the 60s. But, like, I think they're, like, now. So, like, my I, I dated a girl a number of years ago who was, like, way into psychedelics and Burning Man and going to raves and all that stuff. And, and some of her friends were, like, really hardcore, consistent users. And I've met some people here in New York, too, that, like, use it all the time. And I think one of the reasons it kind of gets a bad rap, it's one of these things where it's such a fine line between, like, using it and, like, Using it as, as like moving towards something and using it as like running away from something. And a lot of the people that I've met who are very enthusiastic about it, I feel like they're, it's like, it's an escapism. It's a distraction. Them. Yeah. Kind of like travel in a way for some people, I think. Yeah. They use that as a distraction. Totally. Well. Totally. It's like anything, right? Anything that's enjoyable and I guess intense, like intensely moves you out of your like typical comfort bubble. So it could be anything, like it could be travel. It could be therapy, it could be starting your own business, starting your own business, business, dating somebody new. Like all these things they have, you know, they're not in a vacuum. They're not necessarily like good or bad on their own. They have a lot of potential. Like there's a lot of like energy encapsulated in them and they can push you very far in like different directions. And I think a lot of it has to do with like the intention that you bring to it. So like there are people, like you said, there are people who use travel to escape their problems and Instead of dealing with them, there are also people who use travel as like a very powerful form of growth. There are people who get into relationships as a way to escape their problems. There are some people who get into relationships as a powerful form of growth. And I think psychedelics is one of the more extreme versions of that. It's interesting, like a lot of teachers in like the meditation communities and stuff like that. And this is just what I've heard. I'm not an expert on this, but like from teachers that I've talked to and I've heard, and I think Sam Harris kind of talks about this too. Like they're always very reticent when they talk about psychedelics, because they're like, yeah, it can get you this experience sometimes very quickly, but it's like the vehicle that it gets you there with, it can potentially be messy. You know, it's not necessarily like the best way to get to it because there's all this other shit going on and all this other stuff going on in your brain. And it's 
to give you another example, like, so when I had this kind of like profound, like spiritual experience where like, like I transcended my body and everything, I became completely convinced that my friend was communicating with me telepathically. Like, ESP, right? Yes. Naturally. Yeah. Completely convinced. And I was convinced of this for like two months. Like to the point where he actually pulled me aside at school and was like, dude, it was the drug. You need to stop talking about this. <laughs> and I was like, you don't understand, dude. Like there was no me. There was no me. Like we were the same. And he's like, okay, that's nice. <laughs> but like, seriously, I didn't, you weren't, I wasn't sending my thoughts to you. Like, <laughs> you know, like, and of course, like a few more months went by. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. You know? <laughs> like I was tripping out of my fucking mind. But at the same time, so there was like, there was like a genuine all of that experience that was extremely profound and powerful. But there's also a lot of nonsense going on around the edges. Whereas like, if you attain those experiences, like say purely through meditation or through practice, it's just like, it's a clear straight path to that experience. And I think Sam Harris talks about that. I know Ken Wilber has talked about that a lot. You know, Ken Wilber is, in his books, he's, he's stated a lot of times, like he says, like, you can access these like higher spiritual perspectives through substances but he said like it's not so it's kind of tainted like you know it's like seeing it through like a funhouse mirror kind of which makes sense to me I, i'll agree and disagree i think there's a sense for me of that like you know and i've talked about this on the podcast a little bit but like this sense of like christian morality and christian values really underlies a lot of what we still believe sure. and think and it seems like part of that perspective from people in the meditation space or people who are uh, teachers is somewhat tainted by this Western perspective that drugs are bad and that there's like a level of I mean, intoxication that, that comes from it. I mean, I don't think, I don't think Harris would argue. There, no, and he would not. But I would say some like he had, for example, Yuval Noah Harari on yeah. recently and they briefly spoke about psychedelics and Yuval basically was like, oh, I've done MDMA once, I've never done anything else. You know, Yuval does like two month uh, meditation retreats. Yeah. yeah, like something crazy. He's, he's like, he's hardcore. There's people who just, who get caught up in the experience and then I never really do anything with it. And I think for me, that's like, yes, that's true. Like this yeah. does happen with people. At the same time, nothing is as instantaneous as a psychedelic experience. So Sam Harris talks about this in his Drugs and the Meaning of Life essay. Yeah. If you listen to his first podcast ever that he did, he just read that essay. And he says, you know, like we know that like through meditation, yeah. we know that through these, like we can eventually reach these peak states, so to say. Sure. But not everyone gets there. However, we know that if we take the substance, we know something is going on. Sure. And so from my perspective, it's like, I think part of the issue or part of the problem is just the fact that like, because of the lack of education that so many people have around these, these substances, I think there's a lack of saying, okay, yes, like it can be just this fun house mirror, right? There can be all these distractions on the periphery. But if you know what you're getting into beforehand, if you create well, the right. container for that. Well, and when I, when I say that, I'm not saying that. I guess if it sounded derogatory, I didn't. No, no, you, no, no, you did not sound yeah, derogatory at yeah, all. Yeah. I just want to clarify these things. Because, like, I mean, I felt this myself when I've hit kind of like these higher states, like on retreat or whatever. It's almost there's like a crystal clarity, whereas on psychedelics, there's like silliness going on at the same time. Yes. So that's not necessarily bad or better or worse. It's just different. And yeah, if you're a monk who's like spent 30 years meditating in the corner or whatever, you're going to look at the silliness and be like, well, yeah, it got you there in one night. But there's a lot of silliness going on too, which is true. I think it's they're an extremely useful tool. And the, the thing that's so powerful about them too is that like kind of like once they crack your brain open in that way, it's much easier to get back to that than to like work your way to there in the first place. So there is there's a lot of value. But at the same time, I wouldn't say it's a replacement. You know, like you can't just like, well, why go meditate for 10 years when I can just like do a bunch of shrooms and like see what happens. Well, because then we get into this kind of the this narrative that's so common in our culture is like the pill is the the, the fix, yeah. right? If I take this thing and I have this experience, I'll be better. Yeah. And I think what psychedelics do is they just illuminate things very brightly so that yeah. when you come back into a sober state, you can recognize what they are, but really the change comes with the work, yes. right? So Absolutely. regardless of whether you're meditating or whether you're taking psychedelics or yeah. whether whether you're doing whatever, it's still the work that needs to be done. Yeah. So we can illuminate it, but um, the experience itself is not enough. Yeah. So that, that's like, it's a tool in the toolbox is what I say. It's one of many ways yeah. for like, for example, a lot of the Buddhist teachers who are now relevant in today's world, almost all of them have done psychedelics. Yeah. Almost 
there was this book called The Secret Drugs of Buddhism that was recently published yeah. where the guy talked to 39 or 40 like current Buddhist teachers. And all of them in the book, all of them except one, had been inspired to go on this spiritual path and journey because they took psychedelics. Now, the one person who said that that wasn't the case was lying about it <laughs> and actually had these psychedelics, but didn't want to be public about it in the book. So it's like, this is, you know, I think of people like Sam Harris, you know, he was taking psychedelics when he was sure. 19 or 20. He has this story where he's in Pokhara, Nepal, yeah. and then he got into a long-term, you know, 10 years of meditation. After yeah. that. So it's like... It got me into it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, it I got mean, me into it yeah, as well, so. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's, it's a tool in the toolbox. The work still needs to be done by the individual. Yeah. It just... From my perspective, it can seem to, like you said, crack open the head. So yeah, and, and what I'd like to see too, and this kind of ties into like the clinical stuff we were talking about, is I think we just need to like, as a culture, gain more understanding of like what this shit does and how we can leverage it in a useful way. Because like I said at the beginning of at the beginning of the conversation, like I've taken acid and had like some of the most profound moments in my life, like insights, things like that. I've also taken acid and like done the stupidest shit, like wasted an entire yeah. day just like giggling over fucking nothing, which is fun. Like there's nothing wrong with it, but like it's this amazing spectrum between of like just complete utter silliness and like actual profundity. And and again, a part part of the problem with the drug is when you're on it, a lot of times you don't know where on that spectrum you are. You know, like you. You think you're like on the profundity side, you're actually on the silliness side, or vice versa. So I think there's like, yeah, there just needs to be a lot of like, con- like a lot of awareness around like what to expect going into it, like how to like set and setting almost. Like, no, uh, uh, decompress. No, how to uh, when you finish doing something and you like look back and like process, reflect. I guess there's some word I'm looking. For. Integrate. It's a good one. <laughs> that's, what was real, that's what we'll call in the psychedelic space. It's like the integration afterwards. Like yeah. how do you take that experience and actually apply it and reintegrate it into yeah. your, your waking life. So but, and, but I think it needs, there also needs to be a lot of like, honesty there and like understanding that like, you know, just because you trip doesn't mean it's actually useful. And on top of that, just because you, something felt very important doesn't mean it isn't. Just because something felt very true doesn't mean, it, you know, and so it's like, it's very hard to like navigate those questions. Because you can find yourself spending, like I did, spending months thinking your friend talked to you <laughs> telepathically. And then it's like, yeah, it's like six months later, you're like, wow, that's really stupid. <laughs> what was I thinking? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's a, it's it is a, tricky. It's such a tricky thing. There's a lot of ways to kind of get lost in, in it. And it's like, I really feel like it took me years to kind of be able to look back and like have like an objective perspective on a lot of my experiences and kind of see, see them for what they were. Hey listeners, this is just a quick interruption from our regularly scheduled programming. We are introducing a text to donate for listeners in the US and Canada. All you need to do to donate to the third wave is text the word GIVE to 616-918-3200. Again, the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 616-918-3200. GIVE 616 916- Nine one eight three two zero zero. It will prompt you for how much you can give: one dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, or anything else. And the payment is taken directly through credit cards. Your donations will go again into our Patreon campaign, into the general funds, to make sure that we can continue to create a high quality podcast for all of the listeners who are currently tuning in. We're hoping to set up funds for special projects later on, like psychedelic sponsorships. We believe that engaging the psychedelic community is an important part of building something together. And so we are now offering this option. That's it. Back to your regularly scheduled programming. Well, it's like a, a guy I was doing an event last night, which I, I think I sent it over to uh, this like psychedelics professionals event or whatever. And a guy who was on the panel there, he's a psychotherapist in his like mid sixties and has written a book about specifically psychedelics for personal development. Yeah. And so I did a podcast with him a few months ago. His name is Neil Goldsmith. And he was saying that the biggest, you know, the the major contraindication for psychedelics is lack of maturity. Yeah, basically. When we have these experiences, and many people get into them when they're like 15, 16. And I think there's something human to that in a way, because we're looking for meaning. We're looking for where we fit in the world. I mean, 
people in the Amazon, they drink ayahuasca from a young age, you know, yeah. eight to 10 or 12. These plants have often been used as like this sense of initiation. So yeah. Joseph Campbell, you know, always talks about the importance of initiation for men. And of course, this is why we have like a 13 year old as our president at the moment, yeah. because we don't have anything to incubate. That. So it's like, when, but, but at the same time, because we don't have a cultural framework for that, Right. Then when people had these experiences like you and I have done, it's like, what the fuck was well, it? And what's interesting about the, those Amazonian tribes is that you have the adults guide the children through their experience. So it's like the children take part, like use the substances, but they have their parents there and saying like, hey, it's okay. Like this is, no, that's normal. Like this is, no, that doesn't mean anything. Like it's, you know, kind of like helping them through to, to process everything, which is great. No, it is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, so it comes back to education. It comes back to awareness because you talk like my parents would not be cool with that. Yeah. Your parents probably would them. not have been cool with that. <laughs> you know, like the vast majority of parents would not be cool with that because again, this cultural perception of psychedelics is they're bad. They'll make you go crazy. Drugs and obviously they're schedule one substances. Yeah. So they must be yeah. highly addictive and have no medical value. And so I think that's, it's like interesting what's going on with cannabis, yeah. you know, because that is also opening kind of the yeah. door to have these conversations and kind of getting back to that point it's like when we're 15 and 16 and 17 we're having these experiences i think it can be difficult or challenging to really understand them because yeah. we don't have the framework yeah yeah you know, i agree i agree i think that framework is important framework. yeah and i would be curious to see let me know when somebody comes up with one because i'd like to see it <laughs> comes up with what like what? a framework for understanding like psychedelics okay i will send you a couple resources because okay. there would be developing better and better ones yeah. And I think it, it just, you know, it kind of has to do with uh, the sentence setting. It has to do with the individual. You know, one idea that I've had, basically where I see like healthcare going and, and medicine going is like customized to the individual. Right. So, uh, you know, we're seeing this with like 23andMe with a biotech company. Yeah. Um, we're seeing this. Kevin Rose is now working on a project with the Aura ring, which is a ring that you wear and it tracks all your like biometric data. So it tracks like your sleep quality, it tracks your heart rate variability, blah, blah, blah. So I think... In the next few years, we're going to be able to say, oh, you you have depression, but you also have a family history of psychosis, and you are 34 years old. Can you do psychedelics? Well, probably not. Yeah. Oh, you have PTSD. You are in your early 20s, and you are struggling with X, Y, and Z. Would psychedelics be a good fit for you right. uh, within a certain set and setting? You know, within a certain... So I think sure. you know, it, it kind of comes back into what you know, Harari wrote about in Homo Deus, which is like the sense of data isn't. Right? The more data we can collect, the more science we can collect, then the better, you know, more informed decisions that we can make. So all these crazy things that are happening, like on the psychedelic experience, where, where it's like you get a lot of good, but you also get a lot of bad. Yeah. You know, my question is, what can we do to mitigate the bad? Sure. The, the of weird, course. The, the out there. The and also develop a way to have like the most accurate perspective of like what occurred. Like when you look back at the trip, like have like you'd say the framework to have an accurate understanding of what actually happened. Because again, it's, it's, I think it's, it's so hard coming out the other end to really gauge accurately like, what everything meant like, that happened. And again, I've seen it both, go both ways. Like, something you thought was really profound like, turns out to be really silly, that something was really silly and kind of unimportant. A year later, you realize, like, oh, actually, that like, meant something. I should have been paying attention to that. I had no idea. So it's an interesting area. It is. I do want to get into a little bit about your own philosophy, regardless of psychedelics, sure. just in terms of like personal development and, yeah. uh, and that whole thing, because yeah, I've been reading your material for a number of years. I, I read your recent book. I really liked it. If you could just like encapsulate your philosophy about like, you know, what is the subtle art of you know, not giving a fuck give without giving away to Basically, in my work, so I write about self-development, but I kind of like try to make an argument for pain for negativity in general because I feel like it's there's just way too much focus on positivity and personal development stuff. I think pain is important to evolve for a reason. Like it's there to it's like forms a part of a feedback mechanism in our life, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain. And so I kind of spend a lot of time just extrapolating that principle into a lot of different areas of life. You know, so whether you're looking for you know your life purpose or you want to be happier, you want to have a better relationship, there are all sorts sorts of kind of counterintuitive conclusions you can come to, at least counterintuitive to most people, when you kind of insert pain back into the equation. So, you know, with relationships, I have a chapter in the book where I say, like, actually, like, saying no is probably the most important single word in any relationship because it defines the boundaries for both people. 
defines like what's acceptable and not acceptable. It allows each person to stand up for themselves and to maintain their own personal identity, prevents enmeshment, prevents abusive situations. Like no is actually incredibly, incredibly important. Yet we're always like implored constantly, like, oh, just say yes. Like just go with the flow. Be a good person, like be nice, like all this stuff. And so yeah, that's kind of like sums up my approach to those things. And then the whole not give a fuck thing is I always joke in all my interviews. They ask me, they're like, why that? Why did you call it that? And I always reply, I'm like, well, I wanted to write a book about values, but if I wrote a book about values, then nobody would buy it except for like crazy Christian people in like Alabama and they would hate it. So, <laughs> so I called it not giving a fuck because it's basically like we all have to give a fuck. About it. We're all like every day we're all choosing what we care about. And even if you choose not to care about anything, you're still choosing to care about something. So it's like we're all constantly making this choice to care about something. And the things that we choose to care about are actually like, in my opinion, the biggest determinants of happiness, success, satisfaction, things like that. Because if you choose the wrong thing to care about, like let's say all you care about is just making a shitload of money. No, it doesn't matter how hard you work, how disciplined you are, how much confidence you have, self-esteem you have. If you pick the wrong thing to care about, then it's it's just going to lead you down the wrong path. Like none of the other stuff matters. So the, the thing that actually matters is like, get your values straight, get your priorities straight, and then everything else kind of flows. From so how did you come to this philosophy? What's what's the backstory? Now? I mean, going way back. So I'll tie this into my psychedelic stuff. So my psychedelic experiences, like I said, when I was a teenager, I was raised in Texas, Christian family, suburban Texas, super conservative. Kind of sounds kind of similar to you. Yeah. I did not fit in at all. Did not like the environment I was in at all. And so from a pretty young age, I, I was like a pretty disgruntled kid. And uh, I just took it out by rebellion. And I decided I was at, like, my parents made me go to church. I went to a Christian school and everything. I decided by the time I was like 12, like I listened to a bunch of Marilyn Manson. I was like, wait a second. Yeah, this whole God thing doesn't make sense. Like, this is fucking stupid. Like, yeah, okay. And so I was like listening to Marilyn Manson, Nine Inch Nails. I told my parents I was an atheist. which really upset them. And then started experimenting with drugs. And so I was like kind of this slacker kid who just like didn't care about anything, didn't believe in anything. And the psychedelics kind of, they didn't completely kick me out themselves, but like they were a large component of like what pushed me out of that. And like I said, one of the big parts was like, I had that experience when I was 17 and I was like, how do I explain this? I got to find something to explain this. And I, I went out and started reading a lot of books. And um, over the course of a couple of years, I ended up in Zen Buddhism. And spent most of my time in college in Boston, like practicing Zen Buddhism, like really getting into it, read a lot of books on it. And, and what I love about Zen is that it's like of all the Eastern spiritualities and Eastern philosophies, Zen is like the most minimal, no bullshit, like even some of like the more, I guess, meditation based, like Eastern practices, like there's still like a lot of rituals and then you visualize like Krishna and all this stuff. Zen is just like, shut up, look at the wall. What was your name before you were born? And like, you just try to answer, and they're like, "Don't answer, just look at the wall." <laughs> and, you know, and it's come like, on, like, yeah, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like these questions with no answers, and they have all, like all these like really cool chants and stuff. Like uh, manifestations are numberless. I vow to save them all. Suffering is endless. I vow to put an end to it all. It's like completely paradoxical. Like makes no sense. Like it purposely like contradicts itself on every every line. I just love that. I'm like, this is awesome. So I really got into that. And a big part of Zen is just like, as you're sitting there and like meditating, it's like, wow, I'm feeling great. Like I'm elated. I'm having these like euphoric feelings come over my body. And the Zen master's like, let go of it. It'll pass. You know, like the, this isn't real. Let it pass. And you're like, but it feels so good. And like, yeah, let go of it. And then it's like, you know, an hour later, you're like, God, like, I'm in excruciating pain. And people start crying and stuff. And Zen, the Zen master's like, yeah, that's not real. Let it pass. You know, it's like nothing is like, you don't hold on to anything. Imper so impermanence, right? Yeah, to some degree. exactly. So this informed me a lot. And like when I, in my 20s, I, I started getting like really into self-help stuff. And um, I got like very enthusiastic about it with the seminars and read books and, and even started like blogging and teaching some stuff myself. And the whole like positivity, like, hey, you're going to be, everybody is meant to be great we're all destined. You can achieve your life full of happiness. Like it never sat right. It always seemed a little bit like just salesy. And so, yeah, once I started becoming more prominent, I was like, you know, like 
you know what the world needs is like they need like a zen version of like self-help where it's like oh you feel good today like you achieved a goal doesn't mean anything like (laughs) get over yourself because i think self-aggrandizing in general like just to make yourself feel better i think is just as dangerous as like you know depressed people who like people like people who have irrational beliefs that they're worse than they actually are i think having irrational beliefs that you're better than you actually are is just as bad and so i wanted to like construct a philosophy around and uh where it's like it's not about being great it's not about being horrible it's just about being like it's we're all great sometimes we're all horrible sometimes and chances are you don't actually even know like when you're being which one so that really like that's kind of like the philosophical basis for a lot like a lot of where where a lot of my stuff comes from like i said I, i've read a lot of self-help stuff over the years some of it i really like a lot of it i don't and then like i said too i i've read philosophy on and off over the years and so a lot of like the stuff i talked about kind of comes from existential philosophy which is like you know we all create our own meaning that is actually like the most important and most difficult kind of task that we face in our life and so i i spend a lot of time in my work saying like shut up about happiness like if you just find meaning then all this other stuff will kind of fix itself like meaning generates happiness as a byproduct meaning generates purpose as a byproduct meaning generates love as a byproduct like it's the meaning has to come first and then all this other feel good stuff money whatever will come later and as we this is an increasingly important conversation to have i think because there is this you know i think wrote down this quote from, from your book. So, you, you know, you say in the book, like basically that the crisis that we're dealing with is no longer material, but it's existential, that it's spiritual yeah. Yeah. Um, that we're dealing with. And I think this comes back into work. This comes back into, you know, things that we'll be doing in the next five or 10 or 15 years. These conversations yeah. are increasingly important because where we used to find meaning was, I think there was a sense of finding meaning in what others expected us to do. And now we have the opportunity to kind of create our own meaning yes. because of the tools that technology. Which is exciting, but it's also daunting. Yes. Because suddenly you're laden way more responsibility. It's almost paradoxical. I think for most of human history, life was very hard, but meaning was easy. Because if you grew up in the 18th century, like it was clear what the point of your life was. It was like the farm and find food and like take care of your sick mother and like people are dying all the time. So like meaning is easy to find because life was extremely difficult. Paradoxically, the easier, more comfortable life becomes, the more difficult it is to find meaning. Like all the usual obvious places, survival, food, procreation, like those are suddenly becoming optional. Like you don't actually don't have to think about that. Like we've never had to think about our survival before. We've never had to think about like where we're going to get our, our own food. And so in that sense, the meaning question suddenly becomes extremely personal and subjective. And that oddly makes it a hundred times more difficult because it's it's kind of what we were talking about earlier uh, you know about people who make a ton of money and then have a little crisis and then like oh fuck i'm gonna start a charity or something like because you reach that point you're like wow the only my life is only gonna have meaning if i like go like if i build it somewhere that's a burden that like you never have to take on you only have to do it's like first world problems everybody jokes about like it's like (laughs) it's like top of the first world problems but yeah i think as society progresses and simple comforts become more common. And, like, you know, you get potentially mass unemployment, like a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, I think there's going to be a huge crisis in meaning. I think, arguably, there's already a crisis in meaning with people people in the first world. It's like they sit in front of their TV all day and don't know what to do with themselves. Everyone's taken care of. So we'll wrap up here pretty soon. Just kind of as a last question, who, you know, are writers or speakers or people that have really, you know, there were like five to seven people who have really influenced, you know, your philosophy, the way that you think, who are those people? I always get nervous with this question because I know I'm going to like forget somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be five to seven. I'm going to be on the subway at home and I'm going to be like, fuck, I should have said this guy. So the big ones that come to mind, death has come up in this conversation repeatedly, the acceptance of death. The last chapter of my book is all about death. Ernest Becker's book, Denial of Death, is like, I think it's one of the most profound books I've ever read. Yeah, it's just incredible. Like how he he ties in a lot of like, he basically explains all of like human neuroses and anxiety through like a very simple explanation of like avoiding death or avoiding like confronting our own death. So that one's very big. I'm a huge, huge fan of actually Steven Pinker, who 
we talked about already. I think he is extremely thorough, and I think a lot of his critics like don't give him enough credit, especially guys like Tlaib. I think he's like if you go back and reread Pinker stuff, like he's just so thorough with his arguments. I'm a big Sam Harris fan. It's funny. I would I would call Sam Harris my favorite person that I don't agree with a lot. I love listening to him and I probably disagree with like 40-50% of what he says and I think that is actually maybe like the highest compliment you can pay somebody. If I ever meet him, I'm going to tell him that because it's, I think that's so important is finding people like that that like that can challenge kind of like your ideas but in a way that you just respect. Like I, I just respect the hell out of how smart he is. In the fiction world, I'm a huge Leo Tolstoy fan. Both of his big books, War and Peace and Anna Karenina, I think are like just stunning in how much of like human experience is captured. I mean, when I read War and Peace, I, I remember finishing it and just being stunned that like a human being actually wrote this. You know, like I, I was like how a single mind could like comprehend that much of human experience. Fukuyama's two books that we mentioned earlier were very profound for me in terms of like understanding world, history, like political history and just human systems in general. It's funny, I was a huge Ken Wilber fan in my early 20s. He was very significant, too, because he was one of the first kind of thinkers, philosophers that I discovered after my psychedelic experiences that seemingly explained them in a very scientific way. So, like, when I was reading and researching after, like, in those years afterwards, everything I read it was either, like, super spiritual, like Book of the Dead, Tibetan Book of the Dead, and like all this stuff that I kind of, like, didn't really get. I'm like, okay... I get it, but like I don't really get it. Like there was no like framework or anything like last latch onto. Or it was just like super scientific stuff that would like explain the brain chemistry. Wilbur was like the first one that like synthesized those two things. He's like, this is what spiritual experiences are, and this is what they mean relative to like our psychology, our biology. Again, he's a guy that I don't agree with everything now, especially now that I'm older. I look back at some of this stuff. I don't I don't love all of it. But he was incredibly like he was a huge, huge influence on me. Huge influence. I like Fooled by Randomness a lot. Talib, Nassim Talib. He's um, reticent. To, he's such to a dick. Idea. He, he, yeah. He's such a dick. And like he, the thing about Black Swan and Anti Fragile is like twenty percent of those books is like just absolute gold, and the other eighty percent is just this like arrogant blowhard wasting your time. <laughs> Kind of reminds me of like our current version of like Atlas Shrugged. Yes, Shrugged, right? yes. Like some good philosophies in there, but by and large, you didn't need to write a book that was 1,100 pages. Yes, yeah, exactly. And just like insert your like 200 page diatribe against socialism. So yeah, I have, I have incredibly mixed feelings. I love Fool by Randomness, so though. Just like, especially too, because it's Fool by Randomness is mostly about investing, which is, you can tell that's like the area he's actually an expert on, <laughs> on like all the other areas he talks about. And then, yeah, Alice Shrugged was very important for me when I was a teenager as well. It was like, Alice Shrugged for me was like a, my big, like, get your shit together book, yeah. which I think it is for a lot of people. Yeah. I read it when I was 20, and it was soon after I, you know, my first psychedelic experiences. I think for me, it really made me, it was, it was also for me like a transition where I was going through a bunch of shit in college, like, figuring out really what I wanted to do. Yep. And I think it just helped me to take a level of personal responsibility where yep. I was like, okay, it's up to me. Yeah, to figure it out. And to a certain degree, that's true. Uh, but I think we all, at least many of us, we kind of evolved. You kind of reached that point anyway. But yeah, that book was a big kick in the ass. For me. It actually, like, I, I got much better in school, I think, because of that. Book. It made me, I always kind of thought school was silly. It's like, yeah, like, it was all very arbitrary and waste of time. I'm like, oh, if I need to know something, I'll just go figure it out myself. And yeah, I, I read Atlas Shrugged and, like, it made me, like, take pride. It's like, you know what? I should, like, take pride in the doing a good job for the sake of doing a good job. Like, it's not about like a grade, you know, it's not about, it's like, it's about, being, it's not about pleasing someone else. So yeah, yeah. It's about taking pride and doing something well. There's, mm -hmm. there's something ethical and valuable about that. So that was my big takeaway from that. But yeah, her political philosophy, I fucking hate it. Like, I think she's just an awful woman. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> totally. Well, uh, well, let, well, let's wrap up. If, if our listeners want to find you, you know, and, and your stuff, like, what was the best way to do? Markmanson.net. There's a best articles link on there if you just want to check out a few of the articles. That acid trip story is on there. And then the book is called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. It is literally everywhere. Any bookstore, website. So check that out as well. Cool. Well, thanks so much for, for doing this and agreeing to do this. It was really cool. Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, it's a great conversation. Again, thank you so much for tuning in to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm so glad that you guys uh, had a chance to go through it and listen to the whole thing. Per usual, we will finish up with a few questions from our audience members. We have three questions today. One is from Dan Gee, and then we have two anonymous questions as well. The first one is about the benefits of microdosing. Are they dependent on what you are doing the day you microdose? Meaning going to work, going out and being social, or sitting at home watching TV. Would you reap more benefits from one over the other? Not necessarily, but kind of as well. So a lot of the benefits of microdosing come from the container and the intention in which you are entering the space for microdosing. So if you have the intention or the purpose in microdosing to help with overcoming creative resistance or entering states of flow a little bit easier, then if you microdose and you have like a day of work where you're working on a project or something, then chances are that's going to be a bit easier. You're going to be able to access flow states a little bit easier. You're going to you're going to be able to be a little bit more productive, be a little bit more focused because that's the intention and that's the container in which you've created it. However, microdosing can also help with empathy. It can help with vulnerability, with relationship building. So if you microdose and if you say have a party later that evening that you're going to, chances are as you become used to microdosing, then your ability to interact with people at that party will improve. You'll be able to build better social relationships and bridges with various people. So microdosing is largely about the container in which you do it and your intention in going into it. And that way you then can create the experience for yourself and and however which way you want it in terms of amplifying your overall life experience. In terms of reaping more benefits from one over the other, it just depends on the individual. It depends on what you are orientated towards. I don't know if you necessarily would, for example, get more out of work and microdosing than social relationships and microdosing. However, someone who's extroverted already and is struggling with, for example, focusing and discipline might get more out of microdosing because they realize that their weakness, they realize that they're struggling with focus and discipline and microdosing might help them with that. Same with someone like myself. You know, the reason I got into microdosing was because I've always been quite introverted and I struggled a little bit with social anxiety. I started microdosing to help overcome some of that. And as a result of that, I'm much more socially adept now and cognizant of my place and time and space when I'm interacting with other people. From Anonymous, what psychedelics should a beginner try? I think probably the easiest psychedelic for a beginner to try is LSD. But I would caution anyone who is a beginner and who has not tried psychedelics before a couple things if you are going to take LSD. That's one, to always test your substances and your drugs to make sure that it's actually LSD. And two, to start really low with LSD. LSD is one of the most potent molecules that man has ever created. As a result of it, just a little tiny bit of LSD goes a very long way. And I think that's why microdosing LSD has caught on so quickly is because in the past we associated LSD use with these crazy wild visions and kind of being uncontrollable because it was so strong. And now that people understand that we can just take tiny bits of it and we really don't have almost overwhelming, confusing experience, it makes it a bit more accessible. Whereas with some of the plant psychedelics, ayahuasca, specifically ayahuasca and mushrooms, it's hard to take too much ayahuasca or too many mushrooms. Meaning like, yeah, you can eat 30 grams of mushrooms, but you're going to be vomiting and sick and it's just not going to be a pleasant experience. LSD, because it's man-made, it's semi-synthetic, is a little bit easier to overconsume. At the same time, at low amounts, it's probably the most accessible for a first-time person because it has a very like uplifting, energetic, uh, smiley effect. Uh, more so than some of these plant medicines, which are more balanced and can get negative as well as the positive. The other question is, if you're having a bad trip, what's the best remedy? I think one, the best remedy to prevent a bad trip is to make sure that you pay attention to set and setting, that you create an appropriate container, that you do the experience with someone who you really know well, who cares about you, who could be there for you. I think that's the best remedy in terms of prevention. However, even those who pay attention to all the necessary things for set and setting the container still have bad trips. So I think typically the best thing if you're in the moment and the middle of a bad trip is to breathe through it, just to breathe through it. And ideally, you'll have find a guide or a sitter who will remind you you're not dying, who will remind you things will be okay, who will hug you, who will hold you, who will just keep you grounded 
present and breathing through the experience in itself. Because typically the best way to overcome a bad trip is just to accept, to accept things as they are, rather than trying to change our external reality to how we think it should be. So the best way to prevent a bad trip is find a guide or a sitter who is compassionate and caring and who can be there for you. And if you find yourself in the midst of a bad trip, to try to accept it and breathe through it. So those are the questions for this week about psychedelics. Please, if you have any other questions, go to our Facebook page or respond to us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Third Wave is here. Facebook, if you just search the Third Wave on Facebook, you will find us and you can submit your questions on our page uh, for the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes. That's it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for listening to the Psychedelia Podcast with Paul Austin. Want more psychedelic information? Go to our website at thethirdwave.co and register for our email list and newsletter. Also, please consider donating to The Third Wave via our Patreon page. Donations make this podcast possible. Psychedelics have the potential to transform lives. By donating, you enable us to continue to inform people about the benefits of these powerful substances. 